Uh, we do want to recognize a couple of our graduates. So if I could have Jermaine and Natalie come forward. Go ahead and come up here. You can stand next to me. We had breakfast this morning, so uh, I got plenty of bacon because I cooked it, so uh, that, that helps. But uh, we have Jermaine uh, Augutty and uh, Natalie Harris with us uh, today, and they just completed up their 13th year of school. And uh, so we have a gift, and I want to give you one to each of you. And I want to ask you what your plans are. Uh, my plan is to graduate high school first. And then after that, I'm going to uh, take a break and work with my dad and then travel a little bit. And then I'm going to come back. And then I might join the military and then do the railroad. But for sure, I'm going to do the railroad. you got to tell them which branch. Uh, the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> Are they called leathernecks? Okay, so, and hard-headed? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, we're excited for you. And Natalie? Uh, my plan is to go to College of the Ozarks in Missouri and um, there learn a trade and also um, get a broadcasting and English literature degree. Yeah. So we are excited about uh, what your plans are. You just, you finished all your work, right? Just about. Just about, okay. So you both have like 100 yards left on this, you know, mile, miles and miles trip. So I want to encourage you to stick it out and get, get through it. And I do want to, I want to share a prayer with you that are a blessing that God gave or Moses gave to the, the people of Israel, and it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. And I, when, I, when I read that and I hear that, our desire for you is to do the best, be the best that you can be. Just go out and, and uh, conquer the world, but do it with the Lord. And stay close to him and, and seek him. And we're always around. If you get uh, troubled, you know, or you get you have questions, you know, feel free to call your friends, call your brothers and sisters in Christ for for help. We want to encourage you. We want to pray for you, and um, let's go ahead and pray for you now. But we can do that also in the future. Father, I just thank you both for Jermaine and for Natalie, and uh, for their relationship they have with you. And I just pray that you. Draw them to you, protect them, and uh, Lord, just be with them as they start this new phase of their life, Lord. I pray they do it with uh, hand in hand with you, and Lord, I pray that you just uh, guide them in all the decisions they make in the coming years. For its name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So also a quick mention, uh, for the, if you're visiting here this morning, um, we have a, a meal for you right after church. We'd love to hang out with you. Uh, we've got a couple deacons that are, are putting together uh, just a, a time for us to hang out every Sunday right after church. So if you, uh, if you are visiting here, we've got your meal covered, and the rest of us have brought our own uh, food and lunch uh, to hang out with you after church. So welcome. Uh, yate. And let's stand together. Thank you all for praying for me um, for the past 10 days. Uh, my head is, is getting better. My head is healing. I got all the stitches out yesterday, praise God, and um, still can't feel it. It's still numb, but um, God miraculously stopped the bleeding within a very quick period of time, and uh, then the amazing people, uh, the amazing doctors and nurses uh, over at the little Colorado Medical Center, put my head back together, um, uh, put my scalp back together. My skull was there. It was, it was, it was exposed. 
Um, it was really, it was ugly. Um, it still is. <clears throat> Just look here, not there. Um, but anyway, thank you all for praying, um, and thank you for your uh, your concern, your text messages, and everything. I really appreciate you. Um, the conversation that happened after church, uh, I heard about it. I wasn't here, but I heard about it. I'm, I'm blessed and humbled uh, by your uh, just your family and your, your caring and we've never felt alone since we've been here and that continues to be so uh, so anyway enough about my head <clears throat> so uh, you clap right here Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Faith commanded and the mountains moved. Fear is losing ground to our hope in you. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Sing that again. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name shall be done. Can I get a little bit more guitar in the in the main sir? If freedom conquered, all our chains undone. Sin defeated, Jesus is overcome. In mercy triumph when the third day dawn. Darkness was denied when the storm was gone. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in the name shall be done. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Hey man, you've got a hand clap this morning. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what the Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Free and free captive and 
break every chain, oh God. You have the great thing. Dancing your freedom, awaken alive. Oh Jesus, Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have the great thing. Every storm, be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. I know that you'll do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. You have done great things. the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have the great thing. Dancing your freedom awake and alive. Oh Jesus, I say you, your name lift it high. Oh God, you have the great thing. it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you done great things. Sing that again now. And break every chain, oh God, you have the great thing. Let's sing your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, Messiah, name lift it high, oh God, you have the great thing. Amen. Give God a hand. Give him praise. Come now, fount of every blessing. To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount, fix the fire, mount of thy Jesus. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by. saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace how 
boys and girls, if you'll come to the front for children's time. Fred was giving me a hard time this week. He goes, man, you spend more time on this children's time than I've ever seen you spend on anything. How many of you like bullies? Bullies. How many of you are a bully? Let's talk about measure. <laughs> no. Measure. May. Okay. Are you turning into a bully? No. <laughs> I have a sentence on the wall. I hope. Do I have a sentence? There it is. This is okay. It's a nonsense sentence, okay? There are eight words in here that can be pronounced two ways, okay? And actually, there's nine because one of them, no one else pronounces it like I do. So I'm going to read it to you and see if you can pick out the words. I am an adult human who eats eggs while I measure the roof if they come in an envelope delivered by a coyote. Okay? Isn't that kind of a weird sentence? But if you look at the word adult, some people say adult, some people say adult, human, I'm the only one that does this, I think, but I am a human. I don't put an H on the front of it, okay? That makes me huge, okay? Um, eggs, how do you say eggs? Do you say it with an A at the beginning or an E at the beginning? I know how it's spelled, how do you say it? I say egg, I put a, I put a short A in there, not a eggs. Okay, uh, measure, we already talked about that. You've corrected me enough. Roof, I'm going to get up on the roof. Is it roof or is it roof? It's roof, okay? And if they come in an envelope, is it envelope or envelope? It's envelope where I'm from, okay? Delivered by a coyote or a coyote. Some people say, there goes a coyote, okay? Now, here's what's weird. If you read the Bible, in Genesis chapter 6, something really bad happened, and it has messed me up my entire life. It's called the Tower of Babel. And do you know why it's called the Tower of Babel? What happened there? Nope, no fire. Something worse. It would have been fine if God would have just fried them. But he basically said, because the people in that town were basically saying, let's build a tower so we can reach God, so we can be God. And God said, that is stupid. I'm going to confuse their language so that they all speak differently. And he just waved his hand, and next thing you know, French, Russian, German, English, Spanish, Hopi, Navajo, everybody got their own stuff. South, southern language, northern language, western language. Do you know the word, um, what was the word? I was trying to think. Um, on the bottom of your directory, not your directory, your bulletin, it says Ted's link. If you want to know about the different regions, I put that link there because there's 60 words there that you can look at to say, oh, they are pronounced different in different places. And here's what's really weird. If I say I'm going to measure the room, do you know what I'm talking about? Measure. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. If I said measuring, you know what I'm going to do? If I say measuring, do you know what I'm going to do? Okay. If I say I'm going up on the roof, do you know what I'm going to do? If I say I'm going up on the ro ro roof, I can't even think about how to say it. You know, 
you, you're not, you don't think I'm going to get up on top of a dog, do you? Yeah. You do? <laughs> okay. So here's something to think about. I told you, I'm going to give you two Bible verses. And this one is really important if you're part of the grammar police. Okay? <clears throat> do you know what the grammar police are? I have a couple of friends that are grammar police, and uh, if you're watching this, Ted Harris, uh, you, you can, you'll know who I'm talking about. Uh, here's what Romans 12:3 says: "For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Don't think of people." Don't think of yourself as being smarter than them, higher than them, more intelligent than them. Because you know what happens when we do that? It puts a wall up. And it's like sometimes, there's some people I won't talk to. You know, they have bad attitudes. and like, I don't want to be around that. It's like I just put a wall up. Okay, If I see them, you know, if they're coming to talk to me and I know they're coming to talk to me, I'll talk to them. But otherwise, I just kind of ignore them. So be careful with uh, thinking yourself more highly. Because some people are like, I'm so much smarter than you. It's meh, 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 sure. I'm like, meh, yourself. You're like, I don't, I don't even care. I'm going to go measure something, okay? And here's the other verse. And I thought this was, this is really important. This is in First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Encur- I therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Build each other up. Now, my wife, if you get married, you can talk to your husband or your wife and say, you're saying that wrong, because my wife does that. And she's actually corrected me in a couple of things, because I used to always say, what did I say? Okay, whenever I had, if you have a thought and you want to do something, like, oh, I have a great, I have a great ideal Patty's like, it's not ideal. It's idea. idea. So she told me that. Not in front of the whole church. (laughs) She took me aside and said, Ted, I think you're using the wrong word there. So I had to learn that. Okay. And I know that that's specific to that word because I used to say that's specific. Okay. So sometimes, you know, you're actually using the wrong word, but uh, pronunciation. Cut me some slack. <laughs> I love you guys, and you're, you're hilarious, all right? So, go home. Okay, here's the announcement. Disclaimer, don't look at the website during church. Listen to Fred. Otherwise, you're going to go, how do you say that word right there? And it's like, do it when you get home, all right? We're glad you're here. Let's pray, and let's... Um, Father, I just thank you for... I thank you for variety. Sometimes I just w- wish there weren't so many and when we talk about our languages, Lord, but uh, it's our own fault. It's our sinful nature that we have. And Father, I pray that as we come from different regions and we hear people from different regions, that we can understand that that's what they grew up with. And Lord, I just pray that we can love them and share your love with them. Father, I just thank you for these kids and I thank you for their sharpness and able to hear the difference between measure and measure because I don't a lot of times. Uh, But Father, just pour out your blessings on them. For its name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Of course, Ted, we're all wondering whether it was really the story of the Tower of Babel or was it the story of the Tower of Babel? <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Should we just move on? Move on. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, as you're continuing to hear the prayers of your people go up, I add my voice to them. And God, I just pray that you listen to these different needs, and you're the one that has the answer and the solution. You know what you're doing. And God, I just pray that you pour your Holy Spirit down into each of these situations. And some situations were probably uttered in the small groups that I didn't know about that people are praying for and supporting each other. God, I pray that you answer those prayers and meet those needs too. 
Thank you, God, that even when things are a little scary, a little tough, a little uncertain about what's going on in the future, we can always fall back and rely on you. We love you so much. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, Grandma Harris got Stacy for Christmas one year, the subscription to a Focus on the Family publication for kids. It's called Clubhouse. And uh, she was, or one of them, I don't know if it was Stacy or Jen, uh, was showing me this really interesting article in a kids' magazine, of all things. Um, it's written by Kelsey Walazuski. And, uh, and Ted Pate would probably have a different pronunciation of that. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but it's called Superheroes of the Sea. And this is what it says. In 2018, a marine biologist named Nan Hauser was diving with humpback whales when one whale kept nudging her and pushing her to the surface. She had dove with whales for 28 years, and she had never had this happen before. At first, Nan didn't know what was going on. Then she saw a large tiger shark. Immediately, she realized the whale was pushing her away from danger, while another whale slapped the water with its tail to distract the shark. Thankfully, Nan got back into her boat with the whale's help. Humpback moms are known for always protecting their babies, but people have also seen humpbacks fight off orcas to save other whales, seals, sunfish, and it's not like humpbacks just stumble across these attacks. They actually race towards danger, like a superhero towards a cry of distress. Years ago, a researcher in Antarctica saw humpbacks swoop into action to save a seal who got knocked off an ice flow by a group of orcas. As the orcas went in for the kill, a humpback rolled onto its back, scooped up the seal onto its chest, and carried it away to safety. There are actually more than 115 documented cases of humpbacks caring for the well-being of other animals over themselves. Wow. Why would a humpback whale do that? You know, if I can just stand up here and go completely against evolutionary theory for a moment... This does not go according to the laws of survival of the fittest. Because a lot of times, if you read the whole thing, if you read other articles like it on the internet, these humpback whales, even though they're going against orcas, I mean, these orcas are dangerous to them. Because there's a lot, and it's a pod of orcas, but they will go into the middle of a pod of orcas at danger to themselves to rescue a seal. Why would they do that? It's not like the seal has anything to offer in return. The only reason a humpback whale considers himself to be the superhero of the sea and it's his job to guard everything is because he was created to be that way. That's cool. Know what's even cooler? People are also created to be that way. Why is it even agnostic or atheistic Hollywood celebrities always feel obligated to find some charity to give a bunch of money to? Why do they feel like it's so important for them to show up at a children's hospital just to encourage little kids even if cameras aren't on or around? Why do they do that? Well, I would argue, for number one, because having this Judeo-Christian foundation at our founding that's kind of carrying over in today. But still, even aside from that, it's just part of our wiring as human beings. I mean, we just have this feeling that somehow it's our responsibility when we see somebody in need and if we have the opportunity to help, we're somehow obligated to help them. And if we don't help them, which we might not because we feel like we're busy or other things are going on, there's a part of us that just feels a little bit guilty. Or why is it that human beings feel obligated to try to save the rainforest? Or save the humpback whale, for that matter. Why do we feel like we're responsible for serving the entire 
globe. It's because out of all the species on the planet, there is one that was made to be in the image of the most servant-hearted being in the entire universe. We are continuing on in our mission statement study to where we're kind of picking apart what are the different things that we're really supposed to be doing as First Baptist Church Winslow. And I said last week, we're going to be doing this every single week, and this week is no exception. Let's read it together. So go ahead, Jack. Throw it up there. If you can read this with me. As First Baptist, we want to connect with God and his people. Grow in his word. Serve God by serving others and share his message. So, so far, we talked about connecting with God, connecting with his people. Last week, we talked about the importance of growing in his word. This week, we're talking about the importance of serving God by serving others. We opened with one of the ways that we're able to do that. Even if your health isn't good, even if you're not able to get out and, and mow somebody's yard for them, you can call them up, you can go over to their house when they're in distress and say a prayer of encouragement for them to let them know you are not alone. We're in this together, right? The rest of the world says they're in this together. They don't even know what that means. We say we're in this together, and we actually mean that. We really are here to support each other and encourage each other with our needs, but that requires this third value to serve God by serving others. I would argue it's possible to serve others without serving God. But it is not possible to serve God without also serving others. I mean, this is just who we are as believers. When God saved us, he did not save us to live on an island all by ourselves to where we can just hang out, me and Jesus, enjoying each other's relationship for all eternity, all by ourselves. We were saved in order to be part of a group to where we're serving each other for all eternity, by the way. It doesn't stop when God... uh, perfects the entire creation. We were just created to be this way, to where we're constantly looking out for the needs of others and seeing how is it that we can meet that need. So that's what we're looking at today, four different points for those of you who are note takers that we can keep in mind about serving others. First of all, serving God by serving others. Being a servant is just who we are as Christ followers. Being a servant is just who we are as Christ followers. It's not necessarily even something that I need to get up here and say, okay, here's the four ways of how we're going to be a servant. Do this, do this, do this, and do that. It's not really primarily something that you do. A servant, if you are a believer, is something that you are because you have the most generous, compassionate, servant-hearted being in the entire universe living on the inside of you, changing you to reflect him. This is just part of our identity now. I'm not teaching you how to do it. I'm just reminding you of who you already are. So let's go ahead and read some passages about it. First John, not John, First John. So it's a tiny little book towards the back of the Bible. First John chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 17 and 18. This is found on page 1022, by the way, if you're following along one of the chair Bibles. If anyone has the world's goods, so therefore you're, you're able to take care of somebody else. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, So yes, we are supposed to be taking care of people out there, but that's really more of our talk next week when we're talking about sharing his message and looking out for the needs of others out there. But this passage is primarily geared towards how we're treating each other within the church. It's a brother who's in need. Yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? 
Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Then skip over to chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Then skip down to verse 19. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. You got to love John. You know, Word of Warriors on Friday mornings, and that's, this is the book they're going through, is the book of John. And over and over and over again, they're just rising in their respect for John. But apparently, he didn't really outgrow his reputation as a son of thunder. Even as an old man, he's still very much of a straight shooter. He will tell you exactly what he thinks, and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of shades of gray. Everything to him is very, very black and white. And so here he's talking about how if you see somebody in need and you have the ability, you've been given the ability to address that need and you feel absolutely nothing towards this fellow Christian, to where there's no compassion that's moving in you, there's no desire to see what you can do, well, how in the world can you say you have the love of God in you when God is love. There's something that's missing in this equation here. I mean, there's not a whole lot of neutral ground with John because he's going to go further into even saying, if you're able to look at somebody and feel absolutely no compassion when they're going through hardship or suffering, and there's nothing that moves you to at least pray with them and try to encourage them and try to speak into that, you hate them. There's no neutral with him. It's like, well, I'm just indifferent towards that person. You either love the person or you hate the person. And if you hate the person, he goes on to say, you are lying when you say you love God. Because God is love. And when he lives on the inside of us, molding us, shaping us with his Holy Spirit, the result of that is we're going to have that pour out of us and manifest itself as love for the people around us. Being a servant is just who we are as Christ followers. Look how uh, James says this. Go ahead, Jack. Which chapter? James chapter 2. Verses 14 through 18. Here's James talking about genuine faith. Chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things that they need for the body, that is important, by the way. We live in a culture where we define need as you got to give me enough money to pay my internet bill. And you got to be sure you help me pay for my smartphone. That's not what James is talking about. James is talking about do they have enough clothes? Do they have food to eat? Do they have their basics they need to survive? And for you to look at somebody who is about to starve to death and you have a refrigerator full of food, and you don't feel any obligation to give them any? Well, he's like, well, that's, that's not a real faith. So if they have need, and you say, go in peace, be warm, and be filled without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith, I have works. You show me your faith apart from your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Now, do not misunderstand what either of these people is saying. 
John and James, they are not teaching that if you want to go to heaven, if you want to have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, then what you really need to do is you need to be sure to meet other people's needs when they're suffering and when they have a need. If you want to be sure to escape your sin and be right with God, you be sure to be compassionate and give people what they need. That's not what he's saying. What they are saying, though, is when you have God on the inside of you, that changes your identity. And one of the natural results of that is when people come across your path and they have need, you have the desire to try to meet it. It's just going to happen. You have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. He's trying to mold you and shape you in your innermost being so you can more closely reflect him. And he enjoys being generous. He enjoys giving towards other people who have needs. And he's wanting to create you to be the same way. So here's number two in how to serve. Serve God by serving others to be obedient to him. Be obedient to him. It's a matter of identity. That's just who we are. But it's also a matter of obedience. If you can turn with me to John chapter 15. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. You didn't choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. So I have heard that verse ripped right out of the Bible and say, as a health and wealth message, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. You want a million dollars, you just ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Well, that's taking it out of the context where Jesus is talking about not meeting your own needs, but looking for ways to meet the needs and love other people. So if your prayer is, God, give me more resources so that I can help that person, God is more willing to answer that prayer than God... I really want a million dollars so I can just live more comfy and cozy. He's not feeling very obligated to match that one. Now, there's two different things that we have in here. First of all, he is talking about be obedient. You know, this is what I called you to do. This is what I chose you to do, so therefore go do it. But then he says, if you love me, you will. He's not saying you will. He's like, this is the automatic result. If you really are in a relationship with me, if you really do love me, this is what's going to happen. You will love one another. It's just who you are now. So obey it. Here's, it's so important to him, the whole concept that he actually says he's going to bring it up on Judgment Day. If you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Should be a pretty recognizable passage for you. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man, Jesus, comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, 
You gave me drink. I was a stranger. You welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when do we do that? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When do we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When do we see a sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them saying, this I, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Again, this is talking about judgment day, but at the same time, do not hear me say, if you want to go heaven, if you want to go to heaven and live with Jesus forever and have a personal relationship with Jesus, therefore, you need to go out and find a naked person and give them clothes. Find a hungry person and give them food and, and a thirsty person and something to drink and go visit the sick and the people in prison and then you can be saved. That's not what I'm saying. How is it that we're saved? Jesus, I want to give up this old life be behind me. And I want to have a new life with you. I acknowledge that you paid the price on the cross to buy me. And so I willingly give you my life. Whatever you say goes. I belong to you. That is what makes a person a Christian when they make that kind of commitment. But if they make that kind of commitment, guess what is on your new Lord's priority list? It's like, good. Welcome to the team. Now this is what the game plan is. This is where we're headed. This is one of the standards that I'm going to use to see whether or not you really belong to me. Did you look out for the needs of the people around you or did you continue living your life to where everything was still all about you? Now I will give a little bit of a clarification Jesus gave these instructions to the church, not necessarily all these instructions to the individual believer. This is what I mean by that. I'm not asking every single person in here to Monday go volunteer at the Bread of Life homeless shelter so that you can participate in feeding the hungry. And then on Tuesday, you need to help out with a New Hope Family Center to be sure they get clothes and food and counseling. And then Wednesday, you can engage in your hospital shut-in ministry. And then Thursday, you can go do your prison ministry. And then Friday, you can go, uh, what did I miss? Sick, I got sick. Um, you can go, oh, work over at uh, Alice's place and be sure that everybody gets their clothes that needs it, right? You, you would look good for like two weeks. Third week, you're dead. That's not what we're saying. God has the way that he's orchestrated it. And if you're going to go to Dan Bewley's Bible study, by the way, by the way, Dan Bewley and, and Beth Bewley and, uh, and Louise Brown, where is Louise here? She's in Phoenix. She'll be back on Tuesday night. Um, but Dan's phone number is in the bulletin. If you want to be part of his home team on Tuesday night, be sure to give him a call. Find out where Louise is uh, so that you can be part of that. But they're going to be talking about this in greater detail. When God wants First Baptist to get the job done of being their light in the community, what he has done is he has given different passions to different people in the group. He's given different giftedness, spiritual giftedness, different skill sets, talents to the different people in the church so that we'll fulfill the different ministries so that together we're doing Matthew chapter 25. So number one, we're not looking towards any one person, although some of you try, but we're not looking for any one person to fulfill all these ministries. We're looking for you to find what you're good at, what you're called to do, and be obedient and go do it for the very best of your ability. And don't point fingers at the other people that aren't doing it with you. 
You're so greedy, you're so materialistic. What do you mean you don't want to go to the bread of life shelter and help feed the hungry along with me? Oh, I'm sorry. You're doing a Bible study for youth of parents that don't come to church. I'm sorry, my bad. Whoops, you do that then. Be careful at how quickly we point fingers at other people that aren't doing what we think is so important because they might be pointing another finger right back at us, right? So if you are called to work with Bread of Life, help those guys, give them hope and meaning, you better do it. Don't be disobedient. You find out how you can sign up and go over there. If you're called to visit those in prison, you better do it. Don't just keep waiting for the next opportunity. You sign up now if that's what Jesus wants you to do. If you're called to help out with VBS, how's this, Kathy? Kathy's up there in the balcony. If you're called to VBS, Director Kathy is up there in the balcony waiting to write down your name because she is, man, VBS is right around the corner, and I don't have all the positions filled. Is anybody else going to sign up? If you need to sign up for VBS, you be sure and sign up. Be obedient. It's who you are. If you're called to help out with children's church, if you're called to be a prayer partner, you find out what is it that God wants you to do. How has he gifted you? And go do that. Don't worry about all the stuff you're not doing. You worry about what he wants you to do. And be obedient. But well, here's number three. Serve like Jesus served. We're supposed to do it. We're supposed to do it the right way. Serve like Jesus served. This is Philippians chapter 2. I think this is the other part that Ted read. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Now that each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So he starts the, towards the beginning of that passage. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. See, here's our problem. Even as Christians, our sinful nature is so pervasive that we're actually capable of being sacrificial servants for all the wrong reasons. We are capable of practically giving the shirts off of our back, but we're still looking to see if anybody notices and if anybody's clapping loud enough for how wonderful we're being. We're looking for our reputation in the church to be boosted of, did you see what I did? Did, did you catch that? Because... I'm thinking that's pretty awesome. Or we're doing it because we just like the warm fuzzies that we get out of it. And Paul's like, you know what? How you do it matters. It's not just a matter of this is who you are and you need to obey. How you do it matters. You need to do it like Jesus did it. 
And the more you think about that, that'll absolutely blow you away because here Jesus is the all-knowing, all-powerful, everywhere present, infinite creator of the universe. And how did he serve? He takes on the form, and we're talking about this more tonight for Twice Fed, about the who is Jesus. And it, it's a brain pickle experience pretty quick. And we get the idea that he took on the form of a finite, not everywhere present at the same time, not all-knowing, not all-powerful. He depended completely on his Father and his Holy Spirit for to be able to do anything. He took on the form of part of his creation, man. And not just any man. He didn't say, King Herod, you're in my seat. Hey, Caesar, you're on my throne. He took on the form of a homeless man, a man who was uneducated according to the system. He was not part of the religious elite. He made himself, and this blows me away, he made himself completely dependent upon other people to support his ministry for him to even eat. He served so deeply and, and so committed in his service that he was even willing to let these people kill him so that he could save their lives. And Paul says, oh, by the way, you need to serve like that. Now, hopefully that sobers you just a little bit because then you'll be ready for number four. Serve like Jesus served by resting in God's strength. Did you catch 12 and 13? My beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul says, you serve like Jesus did. You love like Jesus did. You obey like Jesus did. And we say, are you kidding me? You wonder where the fear and trembling comes in? Why should I be fearful? Why should I be trembling? Why should I be shaky about following God and serving God by serving others? Because you're supposed to do it like Jesus did. <laughs> and you realize what that means. You're like, oh, my word, that's overwhelming. Fred, Paul, what if I can't serve like Jesus served? What if I can't love like Jesus loved? What if I can't obey like Jesus obeyed? Well, that doesn't mean, well, just don't worry about it then. Just go back to what you were doing. No, it says, what was the second part of verse 13? It's God who wills and works in you. Fred, I'm, Fred, I'm even struggling with having the will. Great. God has the will, and he will build the will in you to serve. You don't love other people. You don't care about other people's needs the way you're supposed to. I get it. Me neither. God is in us, willing us to change, creating in us a different kind of set of desires. God is the one who is working in us, and his work is to get us better at doing our work according to his pleasure, acting according to his purpose. Our job here then since God is the one doing that inside of us, our job is to constantly seek ways to get closer to God and find ways to surrender ourselves to him to where we can put our lives in his hands and say, okay, God, you deal with it because I, I can't. You get me better at this. You get me more committed at this. You get me passionate about this. And if you're the one that's driving me by your Holy Spirit, if you're the one that's molding me and shaping me, I know I'll get better at reflecting you, not because I'm so amazing, but because I know you are. And it's your purposes that I'm pursuing. What we're supposed to be doing as First Baptist is we're supposed to be serving God by serving others. It's just who we are. But we're also supposed to be obedient. We're supposed to be doing it in the right way doing it according to how Jesus does it. Too formidable of a task, he gets that. He knows how weak we are. Fall on him and let him carry you to do it.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's a little bit humbling to know that you could do all of it without us. There's absolutely no necessity on your part for us to uh, do our part. I mean, it's not like you're sitting there in the wings saying, oh, I don't know what to do until First Baptist gets this right. You could just mow us right over. You could put us on a shelf and do whatever you wanted to do without our participation. Our serving you by serving others, I understand God is an invitation to be part of your work, to share in your joy, to share in your reward to where for all eternity we're going to celebrate the things that you accomplished through your people. So that'll just be this massive party to where we can remember all the wonderful times we had together, serving together, changing the world together, changing eternity together, simply because you had us be a part of your work. God, if there's anybody in here that they're missing out on that incredible drama, Either they're missing out as believers, they they already believe in you, they're already secure, they're already going to heaven for all eternity, but they're just missing out because they're not involved. I pray, God, that you grab their hearts, show them their gifts, impassion them to where they'll get with the program. Find a ministry so that they can know that they're part of you moving and they can experience that joy. If there's anybody in here that they're want to be a part, but they don't even have your Holy Spirit on the inside of them because they haven't surrendered their life to you yet. God, I pray that you change that. We love you so much, and it it awes us how you craft it all together. We just want to be sure we're faithful. So God, build that faithfulness in us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can stand to your feet. What kind of decision do you need to make with Jesus today? Is there a part of your life where you're like, eh, I'm holding back. This is for me. I know that it can use me for great eternal things that will last forever. But I kind of got my own business. You're cheating yourself. God's going to be fine. You're not. You're cheating yourself. Give yourself to something that actually matters and something that will last. What decision do you need to make? I'm going to have the prayer partners come up here to where they are willing to pray with absolutely anybody who wants to pray with them. And they can introduce you to Jesus. They can put their arm around you and pray for a need that you have. What do you need to do? They'd love to talk with you. We'll we'll figure it out. We're going to just start saying, Would you be free from your burden and sin? There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. Would you or you? Full of victory when there's wonderful power in blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood, come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Since saints are lost in its life-giving glow, there's wonderful power in the blood. And there is power, power, one working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, one working power in the precious blood. You do service for Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, there's power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. Cause there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. 
Bless you guys. Have a great week.